For me, it looks like the beginning of Armageddon uh, <laughs> or the apocalypse, sitting in the parking lot watching the snow fall and my windshield ice over. I really got nervous about, you know, would I survive from the car to the building? <laughs> Was it the right building? If not, should I shoot a flare? And, um, it was extremely, extremely nerve-wracking, and I was, I was on the phone. <clears throat> it's been so wonderful, and I'll, I'll get to some of this eventually, I guess. I want to leave plenty of time for questions, but our, our Recover From Religion is just really, really growing. And I would love to take some of the credit, but I, I don't think that would be fair. It's really Sarah is, uh, is making the whole thing. She's taking it from this little, very sporadic, you know, handful of groups and truly making it a national and international organization. And it's keeping me extremely busy, so thanks, Sarah, I appreciate that. Um, not necessarily a job for a lazy guy like me, but it's, it's working out. And so I'm in the car, and it's beginning to snow, it's icing over in the parking lot, and I have no idea whose spot I'm in. I'm sure it's probably towed off by now. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I've got to make these calls because we've got these new people who want to start groups and they need the contact and we need to get you know, information out of them. And, um, and so I've got this guy on speakerphone and I'm trying to get my jacket out of the backseat of the car and put on my black shoes and I'm doing all of this. And I'm thinking, where am I? What is going on? What version of the Twilight Zone am I in <laughs> that, that I'm doing all of this? So, uh, so I know what it was like to go through the weather, and uh, I appreciate, appreciate the fact that you put up with that. <laughs> I've learned a lot in just the last few months. My last message, as it were, and it's not fair to continue to call it a Pentecostal message. That's kind of how I said it at the beginning. Um, but my last message in a pulpit was April of last year. And so that usually gets a few, you know, eyes raised or jaws dropped or whatever the custom is. Um, so that wasn't very long ago. So there's a lot of things that you know that I don't know. Um, there's a, I'm still learning. There's still so much to try to understand about this movement, quote unquote, that I've now fallen in. It's almost like I was walking by this riverbank, stopped for a second, contemplated the course of my life, and fell over into this river, and I've now been carried downstream by something that's turned out to be quite exciting and, and very beneficial to me as well internally. So what I'm discovering is, is that for me, this really was about something totally different than what I thought it was about. And that's kind of what I want to talk about for a few minutes, because Coming from an outsider's point of view, last time in the pulpit in April of 2011, I think I've got a certain amount of a shroud of innocence that maybe can give me an objective point of view that maybe some veterans might lose as time goes by. I may lose it eventually also. For me, this, isn't, this doesn't have anything at all to do with the Bible. I thought it did. And it really doesn't have anything at all to do with any particular deity. It doesn't really have anything to do with, with even supernaturalism. That's all the details. And they're all obviously very, very important and even more important to me now than they've ever been. But what this really is about is the expression of individualism. In a time that our American culture doesn't really approve of individualism. That's what this is about. And so really, it's just one, it's one front on a much larger war that is being played out in this point in time in history. And the reason I want to emphasize that for the next few minutes is because it's so easy, and hopefully y'all can still hear me as I move away, you probably can. I've been told that my voice carries <laughs> by my significant other of 21 years. Um, we'll be walking in Walmart. She'll be like, shut up. Everyone can hear you. I said, nobody cares. <laughs> Even if they hear me, they don't care what I'm upset about. Apparently, through Facebook, they do care. <laughs> That's been a surprise. Um, but what I've discovered is, is that in this point in time in history, we are all intentionally or unintentionally warriors in a very important struggle. And this struggle, I think, is really about individualism. It's about a person's right to be exactly who they are for this brief moment of time that they have on planet Earth. 
And once you strip away the fairy tales of religion, and once you remove the false hopes of religious ideology of a life after this one, it makes the life we have so much more precious and the time that we have in this life and on this planet so much more precious that I now say that the greatest commodity that we share is our individual identity. Because whoever we are, wherever we are, there'll never be another one of us. And that's what this is about, much more than all the other things. And so obviously the tools that we have, even weapons, if you will, that we are engaging with in this battle of culture is theology, is supernaturalism, is the sacredness of scripture, the infallibility of the Bible. All of those issues are how we express ourselves, but I think the core issue is about individuality and about a person's right. If in the United States of America, in the 21st century, if a person can't not believe in 2,000-year-old forms of tribal mythology, if they can't not believe that without suffering social consequences, then just where in the hell are we at in history? Exactly. I, think it, I think it's an honest question that needs to be asked. As a matter of fact, let me back up and tell you just a little piece of story so you can appreciate how this took care of itself. Uh, in April of 2011, last year, I give my last message behind a pulpit. And the reason that I say it's no longer fair to call that a Pentecostal message is because really for a few years I was no longer preaching any real form of what we would consider to be Christian theology. I was basically trying to find a new and clever way to say love your neighbor as yourself was about <laughs> all that I had. And before that I went through a long period of, of trying to remove from the congregation's minds that there was a God who was finicky and petty and judgmental. So I went through a very long stage of God loves everybody and that includes you and no matter how bad off you are or what you think you've done right or wrong, everybody's on an equal playing field and, and it's all going to be great. It's all going to be good. And eventually I moved beyond that into just really a Christianized version of, uh, of, of humanism. I can tell you one thing for sure, just on a side note, in case you're attempting to try that and build a church at the same time, that won't necessarily work. <laughs> That's not why people in Louisiana get out in the heat and come to church. They're not looking for humanism. They know what they're looking for. And if you don't give it to them, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work very well. But that's what I was doing up until April of last year. Then in May of the same year, I came across, and I can answer these details and questions, uh, the clergy project uh, ran by Dan Barker and funded by Professor Dawkins. And through the clergy project, and just, just let me kind of let me kind of slow down and be myself for a minute because I think these these parts are important. Through the clergy project, I began to realize that I didn't have as many obstacles in front of me as so many other ministers have. Through a unique set of circumstances, my wife was okay with me getting out of the ministry. Matter of fact, she was thrilled with the idea. Uh, unfortunately, now we're in this bizarro world where I'm like an atheist evangelist. And she hates that just as bad as me being the other kind of evangelist. So, you know, that's a lot of fun still. Um, but my son, we didn't raise him as the normal Christian at home for various reasons I can explain later. Um, and I had built up somewhat of a resume in the secular world because being an evangelist, whenever I ran out of places to preach, meetings to hold, I would just go get a job. And so I built up a little bit of a resume off and on through the years. And so when I began to talk to these other ministers in the clergy project that no longer believed but were trapped in the ministry, I realized I didn't have quite the same level of opposition against me. And so I went ahead and, and made somewhat of a splash. Around September, Dan Barker calls me and says, uh, would you mind doing a Free Thought radio interview? <laughs> what am I supposed to say? You know? I said, no, that would be great. I would love to do an interview and expose myself to the entire world. And after that, I plan on going to Walmart and stripping down naked and running through the bank <laughs> You know, just you know, anything I can do to totally screw up my life. I would love to do this. <laughs> But I felt like I owed Dan a whole lot because of the clergy project, and, and, and I knew I needed to make a move, you know? 
I mean, how long, how long can you hide the real you and survive? You can survive financially, and I guess you can even survive physically. But emotionally, how long can you survive hiding the real you? And so some of these opportunities would present themselves, and I just thought, that's a diving board. That's an opportunity to just get it done. It reminded me of whenever I was about 14 years old, I was in the martial arts, and they decided they wanted to go to Astro World and Wet n Wild, and, and we were all going to go have a great time at, at the water park, and there was this cliff dive thing that you could do. I was 14, had never been around the water. I didn't know how to swim. But everybody else was just walking up to the cliff and jumping in, you know, jumped about 10 foot down into this pool. And I thought, well, I'm not going to be left out. I'm going to go ahead and do it. And I, I'll just, I, I just kind of for a moment lost myself and just, you know, thought somehow instinct will kick in. Something, something will take care of me. This will work out. And I remember whenever my feet touched the bottom of the pool. And I thought, oh, crap. <laughs> And instinctively, I guess somewhere out of my DNA, some version of cat-like reflexes combined with a drowning ape syndrome, <laughs> something began to happen. I began to flounce around at the bottom of that pool in such a way that I did find some type of buoyance and came back to the top and eventually made my way to the edge of the pool. And so I say that to only say that's about how it felt when opportunities like speaking on Free Thought Radio would present themselves that I thought, I have no idea how I'm not going to drown afterwards, but I'm going to do this because this is important and this is something I need to do for the rest of my life. And so the night before I was going to be on the interview, how many of you have heard the song, and it's probably 100 years old now, called Jar of Hearts? Anybody know that song? A few of you do? Yeah. I don't know how I'd not come across it, but somehow I came across it, and that kind of sounds a little sissy for me to be listening to it. But, <laughs> but anyway, don't play it for anybody who hasn't heard it, okay? Or they won't think the same of it. But, but somehow, on my phone, apparently I downloaded it somewhere, on my phone, I'm laying in bed, and I'm trying not to wake my wife up <clears throat> while, I'm, while I'm playing with my phone, and I, and I get a little bored, and I begin to flip through my songs, and Jar of Hearts comes up. And, and it's this song of a jilted lover who, is, who, who the, the person who jilted them is now coming back trying to get the relationship back and going. Is that interpreting it fairly, fairly well, John Morris? And that's how I felt about religion at that moment. Laying there in that bed, knowing that I was going to do the Free Thought Radio interview the next day, I felt like religion was the lover who had jilted me, who had broken my heart, who had made all of these fantastic promises to me, and obviously all those promises were broken over a course of 25 years, but yet it was offering me one more chance not to get hooked up with somebody else, not to walk away completely. And I listened to that song, I'm not kidding you, I must have laid in bed for an hour, boo-hooing my eyes out, trying not to wake my wife up with and I could feel the bed shaking. I was like, you know, she's going to wake up and think I've had a nervous <laughs> breakdown. So, and maybe I have. I don't know. Maybe that's what had happened. But that song was so, it was, it was literally resonating within me that that's what was happening. At that moment, I was making a decision to do something that I've now coined as identity suicide. Because for 25 years, for 25 years, some of you don't even yet know what 25 years looks like, right? Everybody who's over 25 right here. Okay, that's about what I thought. Okay, for 25 years, for 25 years, I had developed intentionally and unintentionally this identity that I was this preacher who believed certain things and supported certain motivations. And now, I'm about to be on the radio with Dan Barker and Andy Laurie Gaylor. And if you've ever listened to their radio program, it's not necessarily the same messages that I've been preaching for 25 years. <laughs> and I was crying. I was just absolutely crying because I knew there was no coming back from that moment. <laughs> there was no coming back. Even though they, you know, they said, hey, you know, it plays here and it plays there, you know. You know, the chances of somebody in Louisiana hearing it, you know, is pretty slim. Right. Yeah, there's this little technology they also have called podcast, you know. And so I had to make a decision. 
I had to make a decision at that moment to be an individual and to not be this other identity. And I still think that's what all this comes down to. It all comes down to either accepting the identity that you may have accidentally created or that other people have labeled you with or being the only individual that you really are, the true and real you. So we go through the interview. I didn't know that whenever you do those kind of interviews that um, there's absolutely no censorship, that things can just go in any kind of direction. And if you've ever done those, those interviews, you know, you don't even hear the whole thing. Little did I know that before I would come on, they would have this big, big, big thing about trying to take prayer out of schools. You can only imagine how much my Pentecostal relatives appreciated that. <laughs> Some of their radios caught on fire before it got caught. <laughs> it was just absolutely the exact opposite of what anyone had grown to expect about me. And I take some responsibility for that. But the reason that I emphasize that at this moment is because there's so many people out there that are in that same situation for one reason or the other. Some They've gotten that same reason, that same situation, and they're dealing with the same level of conflict that I'm dealing with. Now, the point that I'm trying to make with this is that we can sit around all day long and argue about, well, you know, the Gospels, really, they're all copying this one writer, and all the others came after, and that was put in after this, and, and we all know the history of Yahweh, and did you know Yahweh had a wife, and I mean, all that stuff's fun. All that stuff's fun, but none of that really hits where the rubber meets the road. None of that really gets down to people's lives and the effects that it has in someone's life whenever they have to begin to be an individual. So I would say to you that what we're asking people to do, and I'm going to take questions in just a few minutes, what we're really asking people to do is to commit identity suicide in so many times. Especially if there's someone who was entrenched in organized religion as I was. But it may not even be that complicated. It may be that just our neighbor has a very religious family. And when we're discussing things with them, and we think it's so obvious. I love this little story, and Sarah says I should, uh, I should use it more often. One of the things that I did because of, of going and getting jobs is I eventually ended up in our local government. Started off as a code enforcement officer, and later on I moved on and, and became the mayor's chief of staff and the director of community service and all these fun things. Sitting in council meetings, it was my job to make sure that the city had its best face forward, that everything was running smoothly, and that the mayor and the council members were all looking as good as they could look. That's kind of the chief of staff thing. We had this really long discussion about a very simple subject. It felt like it went on for about three weeks, but I'm sure it was only about 30 minutes. And all of a sudden, after all of this deliberation, one of the council members speaks up and asks, the most ignorant question that a person could have asked in that particular discussion. It was so obviously stupid that the audience fell silent. It, nobody could even gasp. You could have heard a pin drop. People were replaying it in their mind, wondering, did that person who was elected to that seat really say that? And you could see people looking at each other like, really? <laughs> did, did that really just happen? Silence fills the room. I'm horrified. I immediately spin around in my chair and begin to look at the audience to see who's there. Is it anybody that's going to matter? Is this going to be a stink? You know, did the reporter catch it? Is the reporter writing fingers? Once the silence begins to break, the council president leans over the table, looks at the council member who asked the question, and said, I won't call his name, said these words. I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. <laughs> and that's really what this is about. Because whenever we're debating over these small issues that we feel are important, we can explain it all day long. But we can't make them understand it, and we can't understand it for them unless they are at a place in their life where they're ready to open the door of understanding in their mind about that subject. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So kind of what I'm promoting, whether it be through the clergy project or recovery from religion, is that we begin to shape our discussion in such a way that we are dealing, even more so than what we're doing, we're dealing with the emotional side of people's lives. Because when we ask someone to commit identity suicide, like me, they may eventually lose their secular employment over it, which I did on December the 1st. They may lose every family member, which I did, all but about four of the family that I had in this little town. I come from a town of 10,000. They may lose their home, like I'm looking like I'm going to lose my home because of losing my job. They may lose a lot of things. So we can explain it to them, but we can't necessarily understand it for them until we're able to reach into their lives, reach into their situations, and try to communicate with them in a way that is actually worthy of the sacrifice they may have to make. Does that make sense? That's what made all the difference to me. Because when Dan Barker called me and began to tell me about the clergy project, he didn't immediately go into all the rhetoric and begin to say, and you know this about the Bible and that about the Bible and this thing and the other thing. He began to deal with me as I was a human being. He began to talk to me about, I know where you're coming from. I know the problems that you're going through. And I knew that he did. And I knew that that was for real. And then as I began to talk to other people in the clergy project online, I began to realize that the ministers had already gotten out, that they knew exactly where I was coming from. And it allowed me to open the door of understanding. And then whenever I would watch Thunderfoot on YouTube. <laughs> anybody ever heard of Thunderfoot? Sure. Then once I began to go back and watch Professor Dawkins. Then once I began to go back and listen to all the different, all the different wonderful streams of information that are out there. The door of my understanding was open. And I could say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So I just want to challenge you before I start taking questions. Remember that this is about people's lives. This isn't about doctrine. It's not. It's not about doctrine. That's where we battle. That's where we work things out. But it's not about doctrine. And it's not even about ideology. And it's not about mythology. It's not about any of those things whenever you really get down to it. It's really about looking that person in the eye and communicating to them that their individual value is greater than everything else that they risk losing for expressing that individuality. As we used to say in the Pentecostal world, that would preach. <laughs> <laughs> their individuality, because that's really what we're doing. It's not that we're trying to make people not be Christians. It's not that we're trying to make people not be theist. That's, that, that's way up here. That's all superficial. What we're really trying to do is free them and help them recover from the negative effects that we all know religion creates in a person's life. As I've said for 25 years, can everyone say amen? <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> None of that was on my notes. I just, uh, I'll be ready to take your questions. Yes, sir. Um, so for the clergy project, how is word of that getting out to people that might be, you know, helped by something like that? I mean, how do they find out about it? There is this really tall, slender, good-looking guy named Jerry DeWitt that is traveling. <laughs> 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 That's traveling across the country telling about it is one thing. It has a home page. Okay. Um, matter of fact, in October, I had the pleasure of being able to introduce to the world, basically through another radio interview, another wonderful radio interview, um, that the Clergy Project had gone public with a, with, a, with a website. Up until then, it pretty well was word of mouth. What had happened was I, I had such a, a moment of conflict. I had, I had not been supernatural for a long time. Mm -hmm. That my mind didn't even work that way anymore and I really struggled with it. But I was still involved in pastoring and loving folks and helping them with their lives and still had relationships and all those things. And one night a very, very dear friend called with, uh, with some serious life issues. And it's, it's all out there on YouTube now. And I knew that she wanted me to pray for her on the phone. 
And, uh, and I just couldn't. I just couldn't do it. Just flat couldn't do it. Maybe could have done it a week earlier, a month earlier, or whatever. But at that exact moment, it felt like it would have been the biggest lie that I would have ever told anybody. Her brother was in a horrible accident. And, you know, and, and, and so she's helpless. The family's helpless. Everybody's helpless. And, uh, you know, and this is all that's left. You know, and this is what religion tries to offer. And, uh, and I just could not do it. I just simply could not pray for her. And when I got off the phone, I was heartbroken. And so I thought, who on this planet has any idea what I'm feeling right now? I mean, that's how selfish I was. I can't pray for her. Her brother's dying. And I'm thinking, who understands my situation? <laughs> and that's sad. <laughs> just being honest. Just being honest. And, uh, and so, so I, I remember Dan Barker. I Googled. I you know, was able to track down an email, send him an email. The next day, he calls me. And so in the beginning of the clergy project, that's pretty much about the only way that it worked. Uh, as time went on, it word began to spread, but now there is there's a there's a website. And so it is amazing how it's growing with no more press than what it's gotten. Uh, because when I got in, I think I was somewhere in, you know, like the twenty, you know, twenties, twentieth something person or somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. Now there's over hundred and fifty. Wow. Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, with, with virtually no press, <laughs> you know. And, and the reason—forgive me for just not even going to my notes and talking to you the way that I did—but I saw that you're recording. And what I'm really trying to get out, what I'm really trying to get out is, uh, is these people need some mercy. These people who are trapped in the ministry—they need some mercy, and they need to know. They need to know what I now know. That the movement is going to love them and take them in and accept them and build community around them. Because, you know, all you see on the internet is a, is a different face of free thought and skepticism and atheism. It's a little different out on the internet. And so they don't know. They don't know that, they're, that this tightrope that they're walking, that when they decide to commit identity suicide and tip off of it, that there actually is a safety net of people like yourselves. And so word is slowly getting out. We're getting there. I'm going to take just a moment here. I'm going to strut this box around. We're taking up a goodwill donation for Jerry for his talk here tonight. So I'll start it back here. And if it comes around, just if you can contribute to it, that would be great. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did lose my job on December the 1st, so we've been running on fumes ever since. And it was because of the clergy project recovering from religion. Uh, my, my boss uh, asked me to meet him at the waffle shop. And uh, that wasn't unusual for us. It was at noon. And um, he just laid out in front of me a printout of the home page of the clergy project because my name and the interviews on there, and also of recovering from religion, showing that I was a, the new executive director, which is a non-paid position. And I told him that I said this is this is not a, this is a non-paid position, you know, it's volunteer. It's all out on the internet. It's not like I'm protesting down at the courthouse or anything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but didn't matter. Didn't what? matter, yes, sir. What was your job? I was a building inspector at that time. Yeah, I had a, because the first time I went to work for our, our local government, I went in as the code of social laws. And so, you know, I had, had a little bit of experience and some credentials. And so uh, this guy, actually, when I left to go pastoring, um, I hired him to take my place. And so that's how he got involved in code enforcement and so forth. And so that was like 10 years ago, and we've been friends, you know, this entire time. And during the year that I worked for him, um, we were best friends, absolutely best friends. And it flipped just in a moment. Once the pressure from, uh, from the politicians got a hold of it, it, it flipped. Yeah. And this so, is in where? This is in Derrida, Louisiana. Beauregard Parish. We don't have counties, we have parishes. A little bit of religion down there. A little bit of religion. Who else? Got to be plenty of questions because I, yeah, yes, me. I saw, I saw you raising your hand. Does the clergy project take um, Catholic, former Catholics? Oh, sure. Oh. Right. Anyone, anyone in the ministry, there's a certain, there's a certain level of uh, ministry experience that they're looking for. Um, obviously, if a person's been ordained, if a person has done that professionally. But, but what happens is when a person makes application on the, on, you know, on the website, then uh, from there, the screeners get the application and begin to you know, discuss it among themselves and, and uh, not, not, not even the private information because it's all done anonymously. 
so that nobody knows anybody, but just the story, you know, saying this person, this is what they did in the ministry, and and uh, and, and if the screeners, if they feel like the person qualifies, then, then they're allowed to come into the clergy project. Actually, I think we do have a monk that's in there right now. I believe we do. Um, with 150 participants, it's gotten pretty varied at this point. But really, the best thing for them to do is just go to uh, clergyproject.org and um, just make application, and we'll, we'll take care of them from there. So there's a very good chance that they would not only be accepted, but would be very satisfied with their experience inside because... What you've got, I call it an exit strategy. What you've got is, uh, you know, several ministers that are trying to figure out how they're going to salvage some piece of their life. Some of them, their wives don't even know, you know, because the majority of them obviously are men. Their wives don't know. They've raised their children. Some of them, their, their children are now ministers or out even on the missionary field and all these things. And, and now the door of their understanding has been opened for whatever reason. And so they literally feel trapped. I mean, it, it seems so easy, you know, to just to just say, okay, everybody, I'm going to go do something different. But, you know, these are people who have mortgages. These are people who have kids in college. These are people whose wives are sick or husbands are sick that they're having to support medically. You know, these are just real people. That's kind of the reason I got off my notes and went the direction that I did because it, the more that we can humanize the people who are in religion, the easier it would be for us to build a bridge to them and help them get out. That's just my point of view. Obviously, everybody's take is important. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, what is the history of recovery for religion? This is new to me. So. Yeah. yeah, recovery for religion has a fantastic history. How many of you uh, heard of uh, Dr. Daryl Ray? Mm -hmm. yeah, very good. Dr. Del Rey wrote uh, The God Virus. He had actually wrote some other books before that, but the one that uh, dealing with free thought and religion. And once he got out, it was just such a, a revolutionary way of looking at how religion works in people's lives that it got a lot of attention. And people began to email him and call him and say, you know, I, I need help. I, I've got all these problems with religion. I don't believe anymore, but, but here's all this baggage. And here's all these issues. And so he formulated this idea called Recovering from Religion. And really, what it's about is creating support groups where people sit around face-to-face -face and they're able to tell their stories and hear other people's stories. And then the more experienced in the group, obviously, is able to give some advice or point towards resources. We, we call it the three C's. The first thing that we want to do is we want to connect people with other people. So that they're not sitting out there by themselves. You would be shocked that even with the power of the internet right now, there are so many people out there that feel like they're all alone. For whatever reason. I mean, and, and these are people on the internet who are doing things all the time that I talk to them all day long. For lack of better words, I pastor more people now than I ever pastored when I was in the ministry. Because there's so many people that don't know how to connect and don't know where to go. So Recovering from Religion tries to help them connect with other people like themselves in similar situations. The next thing that will naturally evolve out of that type of environment is a level of counseling. Obviously, to facilitate a group, you don't have to be a professional anything. You don't have to be a professional counselor, but you're naturally going to help people and counsel them through your own experiences and then by being able to reference them to other people who may be professionals or just have more experience. And then lastly, the third C is content. Trying to get content into these people's lives and in their minds. Because now that the door of understanding is open, something that they might not have been able to uh, swallow at all years before, such as evolution, now, once you give them the proper content, may become the most beautiful thing that they've ever learned. And usually does become the most beautiful thing that they've ever seen. 
One of my favorite story, um, one of my favorite stories thus far, uh, a lady in Shreveport, Louisiana, contacted Sarah through uh, through recoveringfromreligion.org, and uh, you know they begin to talk over email, and Sarah Sarah sends me an email and says uh, this lady gave her phone number. I think she'd be a good one, you know, to talk to, someone to visit with. And even though she had found recovering from religion on on the internet and and. and watched Professor Dawkins and all of these different things, she still felt totally isolated. She still felt like she was the only person in Louisiana that no longer believed. And it's because of her life, you know, it's because of this identity that, that has been created over all of these years, and now she's in her early 60s. And so coming back down from one of the many trips that Sarah sent me on to speak to groups like this, I'm telling you, she's running me ragged. <laughs> Pass that box again. No. <laughs> and, and, and so coming back down, I, I called this lady and said, uh, you know, I'm passing through Shre Shreveport. Would you mind if I stopped and just said hello? And I mean, you would have thought, you know, <laughs> that, that, that Jesus had showed up. <laughs> 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 Several years ago, we were having this Fourth of July function uh, with all the church folks at this, at this lady's house. And, and I'm walking through. <clears throat> I'm walking by the table, and someone had brought a grandson that had never been to our church before, a little bitty dude. And right as I'm walking by, you know, and I've got a hot dog and everything going on, right as I'm walking by, I hear him say, Oh, Mom, is that Jesus? <laughs> so not to be outdone, I turned and said, Almost. <laughs> I'm a little taller than him. <laughs> so, next question? Yes, sir. Um, in uh, the Collision Project, how do you protect the identities of the people who I know? Because it seems like that list could be very damaging to some of them. Right. It, it's all anonymous almost from the very beginning. Okay. Um, what I encourage people to do is, is to be anonymous. Even go out and create an anonymous email you know, account and all of those from the very beginning. What we do is, and, and now it's a little more, even more streamlined than this, we have screeners that are ex-ministers themselves that know what they're looking for, they're able to move the conversation around in just the right way to see, does the person naturally say what we need to hear them say, you know, those kind of things. And so it's, it's a process that they go through, but there's never more than two people associated with the clergy project that has even a clue of who this person might would be. So if they've come to us from an anonymous account to start with, then nobody would ever really know. But, uh, but, but more, most of the time, they don't know to be quite that secretive from the beginning. So you might have an email address and those things, but we all delete everyone's information, you know, the screen. So like, say for instance, I'm the, the second screener. The first one screens that person, listens for key things, feels like, yes, this is a good candidate, and then passes them to, say, me, the second screener. And, there, and there's just a small handful of us. And now I get to start the process over again to see does the story match, do they say everything the same way again, you know, it's just your vetting, you know, is what you're doing. And then if it does pass, then I instruct that person to then email me back from an anonymous account, you know, with this little piece of information, and then everything gets, everything gets deleted. So when they go into the clergy project forums, they're already completely anonymous. So it's, it's, it's very protected. And the ministers who have the most at risk are the ones who are running it, taking care of it. So they're really watching it really, really close. You know, but the, the, the thing that's important to know about them, and Sarah's going to just kill me for talking about the clergy project all this time, when it should be, you know, recover from religion. Um, <laughs> but but the thing, the thing to, to, to really understand about this is that these guys, and again, I'm apologizing for getting away from my notes, but I think it's important if y'all are going to put this out on the web or anything. These guys and gals, they're not getting up preaching about hell anymore. They're not getting up preaching any, and promising heaven to anybody anymore. That's the part that kind of bothers people. You know, sometimes they're like, well, how can they get up and still preach? And how can they, you know, take that money and destroy the minds of those children? Stuff? They're, they're not doing that. And they hadn't been doing that for a long time before they ever even get to us. They're doing the biggest song and dance that anybody in America at this point in time in history can do by getting up and just, you know, preach and love your neighbors yourself. You know, let's all go feed the poor. Let's, you know, they're, they're really just humanists, you know, is, is, is all they're doing. 
Um, and, and that's all they will have been doing for quite a while before they ever get to us. But even that, and it's a part that I really struggled with, even that is too much for a sincere person's conscience. Because you know when you walk up to that podium, no matter what you say or don't say, everybody out there is assuming something about you that you know is no longer true. They still see that identity. And that is crushing. It is absolutely grueling. So the forum activity picks up right before Sunday morning service and then goes silent, you know, and then picks back up afterwards because they're just, they're trying, they're literally trying to figure out how not to go walk out into the highway. It's what they're trying to figure out how to do. How, how, do, you, how do you commit identity suicide before you have to commit suicide? It's that, it is that gut-wrenching to be trapped in that situation. How long do you stay in a bad relationship? You know? I mean, how long do you do it and why do you do it? You know, do you do it because you don't have another place to live? Do you do it because you're going to wait for the children to grow up? Do you do it because, you know, you, you're a professional and if you suddenly get out of this relationship, it's going to hurt you professionally? I mean, it's the same thing. Is that all making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think down here you have a question. Yeah, it seems obvious. Right, we, we're beginning to get more inquiries from overseas, and Still we're... Christian ministers? Or yes, the, the ones that I know of from Christian ministry, uh, from overseas ministry are Christian ministers, but um, Dan Barker has, has clued us in that he is having several conversations with people from other religions as well. Are they still Abrahamic religions, or are they... Um, actually, there's a Buddhist that's already in. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, Buddhist? <laughs> That's kind of what I thought I might go grow up and be one day. <laughs> what are you getting out for? Yeah. Can I take your place? No. Uh, you know, obviously there's all types of areas. And, and so where he came from was a more, you know. So yes, there are Buddhists um, that I know for a fact. And, um, you know, obviously the Islamic world is uh, even more complicated. And there are conversations going on uh, with, that's right, them and you know I mean it's it's tricky it's tricky you know to, to but but you know to give a shout out to uh, say atheist nexus um, you know uh, brother Richard has told me numerous times that he has lots of conversations with people from the Middle East and you know there you talk about that's more than identity suicide mm -hmm. that's just flat out suicide mm -hmm. and so uh, the exit strategy is what's so important and, and obviously, as, as, as much as you try to make it work the best that you can make it work, there's still going to be fallout, huge amount of fallout, no matter how much you try. Was that everything? Was there more than that? That was actually more than what I was asking for. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I've been doing this for 25 years, and I've gotten that comment more than once. <laughs> I will tell you, the only thing worse than listening to a boring message for 30 minutes is preaching one. <laughs> Um, on your journey from theist to atheist, was there like a like a road to Damascus moment where you're like, I do not believe, like a reverse road to Damascus moment? You know, it's funny. It's funny you say that. Funny and sad. Um, because when my boss was firing me, you know, despite my height and my youthful appearance, I am a grown man. Um, Though on the side, I do work for Santa Claus. Um, no, that's, that's too far. Um, it's one thing to make you laugh, another thing to make you feel sorry for me. So. Um, but, but while I'm sitting there as a grown man in the middle of the waffle shop at noon, um, I'm devastated. I'm in tears. I mean, this guy's my best friend. He knows. He knows what my life has been like. He knows how, how financially strapped we've been since I stopped pastoring, which had been about two years prior, even though I was still evangelizing, but still working secular jobs, you know, still mixed up in ministry. But it stopped pastoring about two years before that, which was hugely devastating financially. Um, he knew my life inside and out and knew what was going on in my life. And so as I began, I'm in tears, and I began telling him, you know, I, this may be the end of my marriage. Uh, we'll definitely lose our home. I mean, I'm, I'm telling him all these things. All of a sudden, you can see it happen. 
just like Dr. Delray explains in his book, The God Virus, that religious mindset, it just clicked, boom. You could just see it like his eyes glazed over. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is what he said to me. He said, um, he said, well, I prayed about this on the way over here. Off to a great start. <laughs> <laughs> now, keep in mind, on the way over here is about three minutes. Okay, I live in a town of 10,000. Okay, I mean, literally like three minutes. As fat and out of shape as I am, I could walk, maybe jog, from, from where he started to the waffle shop. But he prayed about it on the way over there. And he said, uh, he said, God told me that, um, he said, this is first he said this, he said, when there's nothing left but you and death, then God will be able to reveal himself to you in a way that you can appreciate. He's like, well, that would be about damn time to show up. <laughs> <laughs> The second thing was, he said, this is the beginning of your road to Damascus experience. Mm. Yeah. So thank you for bringing that up. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but no, was there any one moment? No, there wasn't any one moment. I, I, I stole this phrase from a minister named Mike Williams in Houston, Texas. Um, he coined the phrase, the question, is your heart kinder than your doctrine. And so I was saved at Jimmy Swaggart's church when I was 17 years old. I don't know if any of you know who Jimmy Swaggart is. Um, at 17. And was in the ministry that same year. I started in the ministry when I was 17 before I could, as I always like to say, vote or buy beer. I was already in the ministry, a lifelong position. And so, so from that moment on, this identity was being, was being created. The problem was, was that I could not swallow eternal punishment from the very beginning. Even though I'd been raised with that in the background, because I was raised by Pentecostal grandparents, more or less. I just couldn't swallow that part. It, it was one thing when I was hearing it. But it was another thing to know that I was supposed to be preaching it. And I just, I just couldn't swallow that part. So from the very beginning, I was forced by my conscience... To, to kind of chip away at the doctrine that I had been raised under to try to figure all of this out. And so this was before the internet and all of those kind of things. So I began to expose myself to other forms of theology, you know, and, and so forth, trying to work all those out. And, and so there was not ever any one real moment. It was this long progression. Because by the late 90s, I had already, I got saved whenever, like in 86, okay. So that tells you, you know, my age. Um, and so by the late 90s, mid to late 90s, I was already through other circumstances, actually two hours away in Des Moines, Iowa, maybe pointing the wrong direction. Um, is that right? In Des Moines, Iowa, right? That way, yeah. um, I, I, I had an experience that made me question the validity of the Bible entirely. And so, so it was just this long, drawn-out, painful thing. What the... The deal is, is that inside my mind, it was like there was a balance, a scale. And so on, on one side was my conscience, which I also believe is our individuality, okay, the, the us, the real me. On the other side was everything. And the longer I was in the ministry, the more things there were on the other side. You know, so, so that is actually getting heavier as time goes by. But the more I learn, so there's this battle going on. All, I mean, for years. For, for two decades, there's this battle going on between these two things. It wasn't until I received that call um, and, and had to acknowledge, because when I couldn't pray for her, because she was like part of our family, when I couldn't pray for her, then I instinctively knew at that moment I would never pray for anyone ever again. If I couldn't pray for her, then I couldn't pray for anybody. And that tipped the scale. Suddenly my conscience outweighed the possibility of losing every bit of our financial security, our home, even my marriage, all of my family, my reputation, because having worked at City Hall off and on through the years, um, I was seen as this preacher who was right-wing, who was supposed to run for mayor in 2014. 
And so there was a political career. There was, you know, I mean, every young man wants to, you know, be important and be powerful. And so, you know, and, and at that moment, I had no idea what would replace all of that stuff. None. I mean, no idea. I didn't know that any of you existed. I didn't know that, that I might could, you know, pass a, a box around and pay for my gas to travel, you know, 20 hours somewhere. You know, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't know about the possibility of any of these things. And so it was, it was devastating. So I wish there had been because it'd make a more interesting story. But I guess it'd have to turn into chapters instead of one event. I think I saw somebody appear real quick, but then I know I saw you again. Was there somebody? Yes, ma'am. So Yeah, it is totally religious discrimination. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. It is totally religious discrimination. Here's the complexities of the issue. And I mean, I'm, I'm talking to people about it. I don't want you know, to be on the internet, so I don't want to go into too many details. But I'm talking to people about it. Um, you know, it, it's complicated because um, in one way I'm a sucker. Because this was my best friend for a year. And even though over his religious ideology he was willing to cut my throat, right there in the middle of the waffle shop. He was still my best friend for a year, you know? And so I'm, I'm not overly interested in taking his stuff, you know? Um, the other side of it is, is that um, I, was a con I was a contract laborer to him. He's a contractor for the government. So there's all these degrees of, uh, of disconnection from, from what would normally be considered straight up religious discrimination. It's still there, but it's just it's just complicated, so we're working out all the details. But, I, you know, I mean, I can tell you, and I don't mind this being on the internet, I will not rest until the people, the administration in charge of my parish are going to sleep at night thinking about me and thinking about my wife and thinking about my son and knowing good and well that they're going to be a lot more careful when they do what they did. So we're moving in that direction. Yeah. I think it's yes. Um, you come from a Pentecostal background. Yes, sir. It's safe to assume that you're associated with the Assembly of God. Yes. Uh, Jimmy Swagger was Assembly of God at the time. Uh, my dad, who died in a car accident right before I turned three, um, his mom and dad were Assembly of God pastors. They founded 16 to 19 Assembly of God churches. Um, so, so yes, I got Pentecostal heritage. But my actual ministry um, was, was sporadic with the Assemblies of God. It was in particular towards the, the oneness, holiness movement. Yeah. Um, what, what I was going to get at was, are you, you would be familiar then with the Master's Commission program that's prevalent. I, I, I don't think I am, no. Maybe, maybe it's something else. And it's kind of like a, like a, a undergraduate. Oh, sure, where they go through the Berean uh, studies? Is that part something of it? Something like that. They yeah. live with the family. They are basically dependent upon these people the whole time. It's, it's like an impossible type of friend. Oh, really? No, I didn't. I wasn't aware of it. Oh well, I, I can tell you. I can tell you the main the main strategy for trying to catch people before they go into that is uh, secular students. You know that's that's the main thing. Uh, secular student alliance. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Uh, that that's really. I think that's one of the main ideas is trying to just get to young people before they make those type of life long decisions. Because that was a big part. I mean, that was a big part that I wrestled with is that I knew. I knew that, that I would always either be called one of two things in my hometown. That preacher or that guy who used to be a preacher. <laughs> that was it. Because once you're there, I mean, I mean, you know, you can almost go do anything else. But not that. You can't back out of that career. Not, not in a pretty way. Anyhow. Yes, sir. Um, I have it on good authority that recovering from religion is going to have an important role at the Reason Rally. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about that? Who told you that? No. Um, yeah, yeah, I should have already got the word out about that. It is so beautiful. Um, and, and once again, uh, not just because she's sitting here, uh, I give Sarah all the credit for all of this legwork. Um, 
we knew that we were offering something that probably nobody else offers, or at least no one else that we know of. Uh, Sarah coined the phrase, there are thousands of organizations that get you into religion, but there's only one that gets you out. Daryl. Oh, Daryl? Yeah. Daryl Ray did that? Okay, so Dr. Daryl Ray did that. I correct. Dr. Daryl Ray uh, did that. And so, um, so we began to talk to the people, you know, with the Reason Rally. And immediately there was a connection made um, whenever, whenever we begin to talk about what our function is. Because what will happen at the Reason Rally and at the convention afterwards is basically we'll be the boots on the ground. Because the whole mission for, for this is come out, come out wherever you are. You know, the American Atheist that's sponsoring the convention afterwards and all the, all the secular groups that are working for the rally, obviously their intentions is to, um, to get those pew-setting atheists to go ahead and be brave and admit who they are and what's going on and, and let's, you know, let's shape our culture in a direction that's better for individualism, to go back to my presentation. Um, and so once we begin to have dialogue with them, it became obvious that, that we have the content, we have the connections, and so uh, what we're doing right now, are, we're writing booklets. I think we may be calling them pamphlets now. We're writing, we're writing pamphlets. They're not tracks. Well, I wanted to call them tracks. I thought that would have been really cute. <laughs> Yeah, the great chick artwork. We could have done that if we could have done. No, it's uh, it's it's just pamphlets uh, with some really clever, clever ideas that's come out of recovery from religion that we will be distributing, and we'll also be the contact person that um, a person can talk to about what it's like to come out. How do you get free from religion? We'll we'll be adding the content and connection to all of those things and doing the on the ground <coughs> counseling. What's really really cool that I don't think has ever been done anywhere before that will happen at the conference in, or the convention is role play. RR will be in charge of actually walking new deconverted people through the process of telling loved ones, telling people that are important to them of what, where they're at and, and what's happening. So isn't that just the coolest thing mm -hmm. ever? Yeah, I just think that's really neat. So. What else is important about it, Sarah, that I'm forgetting? Yeah, well, that's an important thing that, that we'll be uh, demonstrating in the, in, in the pamphlet, is <clears throat> from our perspective, a person, in order to be successful in, in, in recovering from religion, there's going to be certain things they're going to have to remove from their life. And it's a lot easier when you remove stuff if you can instantly replace it with something else. And, you know, to some people that sounds like kind of a cheap fix, but, but I think it really is important for some people in the transition period. And obviously, groups like yourselves, that's what you are for so many people. Mm -hmm. You've removed um, the faith-based fellowship, and now you're involved in a community of, of commonality. So that's, that's some of the things that we'll be walking people through, helping them realize what they need to do. Awesome. Any other questions? We're still in here? Yes, sir. How long would you say there was between whenever you set you off on your journey toward the thing you did and fully realizing that you were? Um, probably the short answer is 25 years. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, because what, what I did to try to avoid identity suicide, you know, I, I come from a, from a poor family, you know. Um, my dad, as I'd stated, you know, got killed when I was real young. My mom remarried and it was normal life, troubles and issues, you know, and, and all the things that everybody lives through. And, and I had created a reputation and a career, you know, with this identity. And so the thought of giving it up for years was unimaginable, just unimaginable. And so your mind does all kind of crazy tricks, you know, to try to avoid that. And, and one of the tricks that I did was after I got completely, totally disillusioned with the Bible, and that was in the late 90s, um, I began to, you know, I began to go into this mindset that, well, that's really not that important. You know, the Bible, that's not as big of a deal as everybody makes it out to be. <laughs> 
you know, let's just use it. Let's just use it instead of pointing towards it and saying, hey, this is God's word. Let's just use it to promote whatever good thing that we want to promote at the time. So that kind of, that buys a certain part of your conscience some time. You know, that you don't have to face certain issues. Um, by the time that I was pastoring, which would be within the last seven or eight years of, of my ministry experience, um, I was really trying to believe. Trying very, very hard to believe. Uh, I knew that, you know, I knew that all the things that we've touted as miracles were not miracles. I knew that all the things that we had said was the Holy Spirit was not the Holy Spirit. You know, by then, I'd figured out for myself, even without the Internet, you know, that, that it was a psychological phenomenon that was taking place and group hypnosis and all of these things. Um, but I was really trying hard to find something that I could latch on to. And, and, and so what I went through in secret, mind you, because I had to stay with the United Pentecostal type churches for years until I moved into a charismatic branch of Pentecostalism where I could have a beard and stuff, you know, like your pretty beard. I wish you'd grow like that. Um, everybody look at me. <laughs> Make you comfortable. Um, but, uh, but, but I moved into a charismatic version, and, and the last church that I preached wasn't, you know, wasn't charismatic at all. And, 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 and the, whole time I'm, the whole time I'm out there, I've got this other part of me. That's what's so crazy about this. That's why I say that we have to treat people like people because life is so stinking complicated in people's minds. It's extremely complicated. I had this other part of me that in secret had this, this uh, doctrinal evolution. You know, I started off by... Because I had such a problem with hell, I had to get hooked up with people that, that preach Jesus loves everybody. Jesus loves everybody. And that's pretty popular right now. You know, Jesus, God loves everybody. God loves everybody. Well, that doesn't really mean much if he's still going to send a large portion of them to hell for eternity. You know, it's like <laughs> a lot of good it did to be loved by you, you know. Um, I think that's a song. But anyway, um, and so I had to then, in secret, move into this other vein of theology that says, well, not only does God love everybody, but God ultimately saves everybody. You know, it's called ultimate reconciliation. and The Unitarians, you know, some versions of them have all of that. And so in secret, I'm like, okay, God saves, loves everybody, God saves everybody. So I'm preaching those kind of messages in the framework of a total different denominational structure. And it made me stinking popular. You know, because the congregation, like, we ain't never heard nothing like that before because I wouldn't sugarcoat it. You know, I mean, I wouldn't just go, okay, tonight's message is God saves everybody. Yeah. That would, you know, they'd say, okay, no, the message tonight is get your butt down the road, you know. Uh, so I had to, you know, I had to, you know, sugarcoat all this and twist it around and water it down. But people just thought it was the most fascinating things because they weren't used to hearing about it. Well, as I still continue to study in secret, I, I begin to get with some kind of new age Christian people that said, well, the reason that God saves everybody in the end is because whether everyone knows it or not, God's really in everyone. Everyone is a child of God. God is the father of all, and Christ is hidden in every man. And believe it or not, there's scriptures for all of this stuff. It's all, you know, I mean, there's things you can use for all of this. And so, like, I was, that was awesome. God's in everybody. So now... I don't, even, I don't even have to feel bad about not giving an altar call, right? Because not only do we know God loves everybody and saves everybody, but really God's already in everybody. So, you know, it made my whole job a lot easier, you know, <laughs> conscience-wise. You know, so, so that was the next level. Then as I continue to study in secret, I come across this guy named Joseph Campbell. I don't know how many of you have studied, you know, with Joseph Campbell. And he begins to say, you know, I've looked at all of these different religions and all of these different mythologies, and, and I've come to the conclusion, so says Joseph, that really God's kind of this metaphor for this eternal dialogue, this struggle that's going on inside of human beings to deal with the harshness of reality. So God saves everybody, God loves everybody, God saves everybody, God's in everybody. God really is everyone's internal dialogue, right? This thinking, this their thinking, this, this idea they have. Well, then you're only one book away from God is a delusion. <laughs> so you've probably all read that. You know, but all of that's in secret. And all of that, I'm trying to take 
good stuff out of that. That's how complicated this is. I'm trying to take good stuff out of that and feed it, as it were, to people that I really loved and who really loved me. I have no animosity towards the Christians that I knew. Uh, I have no animosity towards any church, any pastor, any preacher, any anybody, none. I loved them, they loved me. I mean, that's what gets you out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning to go see somebody in the emergency room when, you know, they really should have went to the doctor on Monday, you know. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's what makes you do it, not the money. So, I don't even remember why I got off onto all that, but, but there you go. Yes, sir. How come you went down this road and so many other preachers don't? What's, what's different about you? I'm smarter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, I think it's two things. I think it's two things. From the very beginning, for whatever reason, and I don't know, I, I, can't, I can't back all the way up to you know, when I was five and say this is the deal. I absolutely love truth. I mean, I love truth. I pursued truth with all of my heart. Um, and of course, because of my, my upbringing, I thought Jesus was the truth and the way and the life, right? And so I pursued him with all of my heart and tried to make him real in my life. I mean, literally real, real like this podium is real, was my goal. Whether that required fasting, I won't even tell you how many days in a row I've fasted because you would not believe it, especially not looking at me now. But, <laughs> man, y'all laughed at all the wrong things. No. Um, but, but, I mean, fasting, praying, sacrificing, doing all the things, doing all the things we did, in order to know Jesus as real as, as real as I sense this podium because he was the truth and I want to know the truth. So from the very beginning, I had this insatiable love for what was true. And that really began to flourish when I began to dissect Scripture, okay? Because the first level of that operation was which doctrine is correct? Let's compare doctrines and let's, let's, let's base them on the foundation of Scripture but then the next level of that is, is let's start, let's start figuring out where these scriptures came from, you know, where these verses originate, and what's the reason behind the verses. So my love for truth just kept me drilling down and down and down and down, trying to find bedrock, you know, was what was happening. The second motivation is I just love people. I mean, I do. I, I just literally love people. I, I can tell all y'all I love you, and you'd be like, oh, you don't even know me, you don't love me. Yeah, I really do. I really, really love people. So... When I saw this issue about eternal punishment, that coincided with loving people and wanting to know the truth, digging down. But also, when religion wasn't working, it was, it was bad enough for it not to work for me. But when it wasn't working for the people that I loved, then, then the door of your understanding has to be wedged open and say, you know, why? Why is this? Why is it not working? So, you know, maybe that be summed up on really just taking it seriously. You know, I think so many people do not take it seriously. Um, ministers, you mean? Ministers, yeah, yeah. I, 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 think, I think they don't, and I don't mean that they've got bad motivations, okay? I don't mean it that way at all. I think if you could somehow make them get outside of their identity that's been created and play back for them some of the things that they say, they would be horrified, you know. I think they say it and they never even think about it. You know, I, a perfect example, my grandmother, who I love dearly, she's the matriarch of our family, she's the one that I don't want to disappoint the most. She was in the hospital, we were talking about the Bible, I'm trying to ease this subject along, and I said, you know, we wouldn't have as much trouble as we have if people wouldn't have been, wouldn't have taken the Bible literally. If they would have just read the story and said, now what good meaning can we draw out of that and move on? I said, but when you take it literally, there's some really good problems, you know. And she's like, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, little things like all of those babies drowning here in the flood. You know, all of those babies drowning here in the flood. She says to me, she says, oh, that stuff happened all through the Bible. Well, what that tells me, because I learned love from her. She is the person that I emulated and learned how to love people, you know, by watching her example. She would let anybody come sit at her kitchen table and love them. And so that's how I know what love is, is through her. 
So I know she doesn't take that seriously. You know, in her mind, when she reads that, and not just her, but I think everyone else like that, when they read it, they are not putting themselves in that scenario, playing it out and imagining what would that be like if this was really happening, you know. But because I pursued truth and loved people, I couldn't help but do that. Every time I read a story, I was there wondering, you know, what would it be like? What would I be doing? What would be happening if it was raining and the waters had got up beyond our, you know, beyond our, our houses? And what would it be like? So it's a long, drawn-out explanation, I know, but I, I think that's a big part of it. They just really don't take it seriously. Yes, sir? Um, you talked a lot in the beginning about um, how this is about individuality and how we're helping people admit who they are. I was wondering, how do you um, distinguish between when you're helping somebody admit who they actually are and when somebody actually, their, not that identity that's been built for them, but their actual identity is um, within the Christian church or within a church? How do you um, distinguish between trying to say convert someone to atheism and yeah. between allowing them to admit that they aren't really a believer? Well, I think, obviously, it'd be very diff difficult, if not impossible, to get inside somebody's head and to know what's really going on. One of the phrases that we use in Recovering from Religion is, heal the sick, because we're, you know, say, basing that off the God virus idea. Heal the sick and shoot the zombies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because there's some people that are just so infected, there's no use talking to them, there's no use, I mean, I suggest run first, you know, get as far away from them as possible so they don't accidentally trip you and eat your brain. <laughs> because they will eat your brain if they're a zombie. You'll spend all of your brain energy trying to fix someone who is already gone. Um, so, so someone like that, there wouldn't really, I, I wouldn't even know how to begin with them. And don't even know if you could. Because there's so many complicated elements in their life that they might, you know, I mean, you might could, you know, I don't even know how you could do it. You, you might could suddenly um, take them back in time to the Big Bang, you know, and say, you know, look, we went billions of years, this is for real. And depending on what's going on in their mind, they may still not be able to accept that. They may still have to justify it some way. So to me, the people to work with are the people that you can see that, that for them, the God virus is a flu. And they're feverish, and they're achy, and they're hurting, and they want some relief, and they're looking for some NyQuil, and they're looking, you know, and that's the ones that, that I am attracted to working with. So I think, I think that's a very, very important part. So how to work with someone else, I don't, even, I don't even know how to begin to do it. It's just too complicated. You know, I mean, all you got to do is turn on talk radio and listen to how, how sincere and vehement these people are. And it's so opposite of the reality, but there's no way, there's no way to show it to them. I know we're getting close. We've got about 15 minutes before this yeah. thing closes up. Anybody else? I love talking. Somebody else can say. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What religion is your wife? Is she recovering as well? <laughs> um, you know, to be fair, even though this would be on the internet, I would say she's probably not recovering, uh, or at least not recovering very quickly. Um, we affectionately refer to her. My son is an out-and-out -out atheist. He's 19. If he walked in, he'd look like Thor just walked in the room. <laughs> uh, long, blonde, locks, and, you know, all of this. Um, don't ask me to explain it. <laughs> um, That's but uh, so he's out and out atheist. He's cool. He's my hero. Um, and, and he looks just like me in the face, just to stop any rumors <laughs> going around the world. Uh, see, that's why Jerry left religion. He found out. No. Uh, but, but my wife, we affectionately refer to her as an happy theist. She just couldn't care less if there was or wasn't at this point. The reason I say that she's not recovering very quickly is because of how deep-rooted her religious experience is uh, and, and the way that it came about. You know, she, she was raised, for the first 13 years of her life, it was in a home full of uh, people, we call them backsliders. Are y'all close enough to the South to have backsliders? You know what backsliders are, anybody? 
Yeah, that's a person who acts like they don't believe, lives like they don't believe, but really does believe and feels bad about it. You know, I mean, like, you'll go get a beer because you want a beer, okay? They'll go get a beer because, you know, they're pouting about, you know, something. You know, I mean, it's, you know, there's this guilt thing involved in it, you know? Um, and so they were, they, you know, she was raised by backsliders. And at age 13, they went to a revival, got refilled with the Holy Ghost, and life changed for her instantly at 13, and that was a bad time. And so, you know, she was dressing the dress, talking the talk, walking the walk in public, but wanted nothing to do with it in her heart. And whenever, you know, when we got married and fell in love, she's like, she'd give it a try again. And she found out she was right. That really does suck. <laughs> and worse than she had ever known, because now she's on the evangelistic field with me. I'm telling you, crazy things can happen. I literally had to keep two men from breaking into our parsonage door. We were, we were preaching a revival in Mississippi, and this house had been converted into a sanctuary that had taken this huge garage and made it into this beautiful sanctuary. And so we lived in like this brick home that's, you know, this is all built from. And so one of the Sunday school rooms was also a bedroom for the evangelist. And there was so much controversy going on in that particular church. We were still asleep, and I heard him coming down the hall to get us and drag us out of the church and put us in our cars and forcibly make us leave. And so she was still in the bed in her night clothes, you know. And so I got to the door in time and wedged myself between the door and the door facing so that they couldn't see her and couldn't get in and begged them to just take me into the sanctuary where they had some very unkind things to say to me for about three and a half hours. Oddly enough, I felt moved by the Spirit to end that revival that day. <laughs> so these were people in the church? Who found out that you were coming out? No, no, no. I, I wish it would have been that. I wish it had been something that I could, you know, use that way. No, it was just it was just literally that the doctrine, the one little piece of doctrine that, that I was hitting on whenever I was preaching during that revival was contrary to something that they believed. And that little piece? Yeah. It was really about, oddly enough, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> so embarrassed. It was really about the, um, the reality of, we called it Holy Ghost, you know, because we were, you know, Pentecostal. But the, the involvement of the Holy Spirit in a person's life and the impartation of the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, that the Holy Spirit was able to operate through the believer and, you know, do all these kind of wonderful things. And at the time, I was completely, totally convinced that that was the truth and that it was happening for me. And these, but even though these people were Pentecostal, looked and acted just like the rest of us, they were this one little crazy little niche and they just didn't like it. I mean, just a couple of people in the church, but they, they were gonna purify the church and come get us. <laughs> Not the first time I left running. <laughs> Well, they felt, that, they felt that my ministry and the influence of my messages was defiling the church. I was putting false doctrine. I was a false prophet. And so they were going to, they were going to save their church and their congregation. Regardless of what the pastor or the rest of the ministry or anybody thought, they, they were just going to take it upon themselves to do it. Okay. So yeah. it's just kind of like correcting some misbehavior. Not correcting like, misbehavior. Not exactly. like purify as in capital P purify. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, you take on yeah, that's right. No, no. This this happened. This happened in the South, not the Middle East. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yes, um, you mentioned at one point when you were speaking that your son wasn't raised in a typical like Christian. Uh, right. Sorry. And what do you what do you mean by that? You just sort of kept the religion outside of. Yes. Exactly that. Yeah. Obviously, he was exposed to it because he was at church with us every time the doors opened. Um, and he was exposed to my ministry, people being at our home and me ministering to them and, and living on the phone. He grew up with me on the phone uh, or having to leave out and go do things uh, ministry-wise. But we just, we didn't pray over meals. We didn't have Bible studies at home. I, I studied in private for messages and so forth. We didn't uh, screen any form of secular entertainment from him. I mean, obviously, we tried to keep him with age-appropriate materials, you know. My wife wouldn't say that we did. Uh, but I felt like it was okay. You know, I mean, The Simpsons at three, that's not a problem, is it, right? Um, you know, so, so, so yeah, we just kind of had a regular home, you know. Was that intentional? Yes, every bit intentional. 
For me, it was intentional because I always contributed. Um, my dad, growing up as a preacher's kid, I contributed his his behavior that eventually led to his alcoholism and to his car wreck that killed him. Um, I contributed it to the pressures of being in a preacher's home. And then my wife, see, she wasn't in a religious home until she was 13. So she wasn't all crazy about it anyway. Yes, sir. So if um, your son bought off the topic of religion, did you just say, oh, we don't talk about that? Or how did you handle that? You know, oddly enough, it's so strange. I mean, probably anybody watching this is going to say, I knew he wasn't a believer to start with, you know. That's what they always like to say, you know. Uh, but I challenge my life to their life any day of the week. Um, we just, I love science. And so that was something that he loved from the very, very beginning also. So we just shared a lot of science. So it was some of the hard questions just never really even came up. You know, because he just had already been exposed to science. So, you know, um, I'm sure in his early teenage years, because he was in the youth group with all the other people, I'm sure he had his moments, you know, that the emotional side of it pulled on him. I, I know that he did. But, you know, we just never had to talk about, you know, and, 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 and because I started so early looking at it from other directions, my messages didn't emphasize the things that would be challenging. Yeah, so, yes, ma'am. So, how old was he when he came out as atheist? He's 19 now, so probably, probably as early as 17, 16 or 17. He was. He may not have been using the word, but he was. He was pretty straightforward about things, and he's he's even still way out there ahead of me, you know, on things. Because he'd be like, you know about this group, you know about this, you know about that, you know. And he'd be like, did you see my Facebook post? And I'd be like. Should I see it? <laughs> You'll be like, no, probably not. <laughs> yeah, I think it's about six or seven minutes till. Is there time for one more? If there's one, only one more. I don't know what time they turn the lights off. Yes, and, and, and yeah, and let me clarify that. That's a great point. I'm glad you caught me on that. They're able to take their religion seriously and their mission seriously and propagating their religion seriously. That's not quite the same as actually taking, picking up the Bible and taking the contents of the Bible itself seriously. That, and that's what I was referring to. Oh, that. the content. Okay. Yeah, the content of it. Yeah, because they they're obviously very serious. The sacrifices that they made to do those things um, is, is huge. So, so I never doubt anyone's sincerity in, in that way. I really don't. The, the only thing, if, if I knew that person well enough, what I would be interested in is, is trying to understand what in that person's life changed that made them look for comfort in religion in the first place. Because unfortunately, in, in the skeptic and free thought movement, the atheism movement, I think we've yet to um, expound, we've yet to explain and, and, and expose people to the comfort that is available in, in reason, well enough for it to be a competitor against religion in the free market of thoughts. So, so I, I would want to know what happened and try to back up from that moment. But if they're dealing with something, I mean, if there's a reason that they've moved in that way, there's just no simple way of pulling them back from that. I, I just have to talk again. I, I honestly think that may, you may have answered my question already, that they go towards that because they love people and want to help. Sure. And recovering from religion isn't big enough for you to know that sure. you can minister to people. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's no doubt. Every minister that I've ever known, to one degree or the other, was a humanist. Yeah. Loved humans. Thought of humans first and foremost. Um, but there's got to be another component there that makes a person say, say, I'm going to join the army because I want to defend my country and save my family, or I'm going to join, uh, you know, uh, you know, United Corps or something, you know, some, some other form versus I'm going to go be involved in religion. So, and it could be as simple as that's the only influence that that person has on them, and that's the only avenue that they know. So, but there's, there's definitely something there. Something important for that person's life. That, that, that's, that's key, is understanding that this is about lives and about people trying to deal with the same harshness of reality that we're all dealing with. So, so that actually may be your key. If you find out that that particular person is, is really a humanist, then you can expose them to the fact that there are humanists outside of religion. And you may at some point be able to show them the damage that religion does to the humans that they love so much. You know, but it's going to take a very special circumstance to open, you know, to have the door of understanding open.